Hello and welcome to episode 3 of True Crime Finland, Yoshio Tani. As the title already suggests, this is a true crime podcast and it details cases that can be disturbing and violent. Because of this, I encourage you to use your discretion and stop listening or skip ahead if you need to. If you're ready, let's get started with today's case. Yoshio Tani, born either in 1945 or 1946, was originally a Japanese engineer, but in 1990 he was living in Nurmjärvi in southern Finland with his Japanese wife Mitsuyo. Not a lot is known of his past or why and when he had decided to move to Finland. But Finland does have a special connection with Japan. Helsinki and Finland in general have become very popular tourist destinations among Japanese people and trade between the two countries has only been growing. At the time, in and around 1990, Tani had been trying to sell several hundred kilos of gold. Some sources state that the amount was 200 kilograms, others claim that it was closer to 500 kilograms. I could not find a definitive answer, but whatever the specific number may be, we are talking about enormous amounts of gold. Tani alleged this gold to have originated from concentration camps that were in place during the Nazi Germany era and that the gold was owned by Tani himself, by a Nazi officer who had recently passed away and by Adolf Enrod. Enrod, still alive at the time, was a Finnish general who had served during the Winter and Continuation Wars and who became a prominent figurehead for the veterans later on in his life. Allegedly, the gold had been stored in Enrod's home ever since the wars. Now, a Nazi gold treasure sure sounds like an urban legend, but there is actually a basis to these rumors. It is believed that the Nazi regime stole the assets of their victims deposited them, and then used these assets to finance the war. So, the Nazi gold refers to gold reserves that the regime transferred to overseas banks during World War II. At times, the gold was also exchanged for currency with help from various collaborative institutions. However, neither the identities of these institutions nor the extent of the transactions are known. There was also a civil suit brought in the year 2000 against the Franciscan Order and the Vatican Bank, among other defendants, concerning the present location of the Nazi gold. But the suit failed, and the whereabouts of the so-called treasure still remain unclear. There was a lot of interest in this gold treasure that Donny was advertising. Businessmen Mikhail Preisfraund, Juhan Atunen, Yrjö Vasiljev, Markku Nylund and Juha Pekka Hakala were helping their clients mediate the trade with Tani as there were a lot of buyers coming from ab- abroad. Potential buyers who were interested in the gold even traveled all the way from various countries to Finland and this is why they needed mediators. However, the trades with the foreign buyers always fell through as the buyers usually wanted to make the contract in a bank, but Dani did not agree to this. The latest potential buyer very interested in the gold was Turka Elavirta, a gold seller from Turku, a city located about 170 kilometers from the capital. Helping him mediate the trade and acting as an interpreter was Juhani Komulainen, a businessman from Helsinki. The man agreed to buy 200 kilograms of gold for five and a half million marks from Tani. 
Elovirta Fish finalized this trade in Hotel Litorni, located in Helsinki Center, but Tani did not agree to this request and instead invited the buyers to Pikkala Golf Center, which is located near Kirkonummi. There, Tani owned three different holiday flats or rooms, and he suggested to meet in one of these rooms. The businessman eventually agreed to this arrangement, even though the mentioned location was quite secluded, away from the city. When arriving to Pikkala Golf Center with Juhani Komulainen, Eloverta was carrying two bags that contained the five and a half million marks, about one million four hundred thousand euros in today's money, in thousand mark notes. Tani was waiting for the men, but he was not carrying any gold contrary to what was agreed to before. The next day, the body of Juhani Komulainen was discovered in Vuasari, Helsinki. He had been shot execution style. Komulainen had been seen the previous evening at a gas station quite far from the location he was found and the police immediately thought that he had been killed elsewhere and then moved. The following day, police requested eyewitnesses to report sightings of a turquoise Fiat Chroma that was found in the Helsinki Wanta airport parking garage. This car belonged to the other businessman, Turka Elovirta, who was now missing. In a few days, the police arrested three people suspected to be involved in the murder of Juhani Komulainen. At this time, they also issued a warrant for Turka Elavirta. The police quickly uncovered that the death of Komulainen and the suspicious disappearance of Elavirta were linked to the selling of the Nazi gold treasure. However, the police were sure that this gold did not exist. Some of the five mediators that were helping their clients were adamant in their claims that the gold did in fact exist and told the police that it had been kept safe in 10 kilogram bars in the home of Adolf Andrut. One of these five mediators I mentioned before, Juha Pekka Hakala, had his own cleaning business. His neighbors suspected that something fishy, like drug trade, was being handled in the company's building, and they let a local newspaper know about this. When the article came out and Hakala saw it, he got angry and contacted the editors. He vehemently denied any drug trafficking taking place, and let it be known that he hated drugs. He continued on by talking about the gold incident. He said he strongly believed that the gold did exist, even though he had only seen one bar of it. He also claimed to have bought 200 kilograms of it from Juhani Komulainen, who, as I mentioned, had by now been found dead. He then said he had sold the gold onwards to Bense Oy, who was owned by another mediator, Yurya Vasiliev. Bense Oyu was then supposed to sell this gold once more to Elavirta, who also owned his own business but who was now missing. Hakala suspected that Elavirta too had been murdered and that a criminal organization had committed both of these murders. About a week onwards, the body of Turka Elavirta was discovered in a gravel pit in Huvinka, about 60 kilometers from Helsinki. He too had been shot execution style, but the money he was carrying originally was nowhere to be found. There are several gravel pits in this area, and they are located in a secluded part away from any houses or people which is why it was difficult and took a long time to locate the body. The police started investigating the last moments of the two murdered businessmen and the trail led to Nurmiarvi and to Yoshio Tani. 
After the murder incident, Tani had flown to Tokyo and then back to Finland, making one stop in Zurich, Switzerland, on his way back. In his home, the police recovered half of the 5 million marks that had disappeared, a pistol, and five 7.65 caliber shells. Tani was quickly arrested and jailed, suspected of committing the two murders. His wife, Mitsuyo, was also arrested, suspected of helping Tani conceal the bodies and the stolen money. Tani himself strongly claimed he was innocent. According to him, the murders were actually committed by a German man in his 30s or 40s named Hans, whose driver Tani claimed to be. Tani stated that this Hans murdered the gold sellers and then demanded Tani to get rid of the bodies, clean up the murder scene at Piccola Golf Center, and then bring a part of the stolen money to Germany. In his own words, this is why Tani traveled from Japan to Zurich. He explained that once there, he exchanged the money into francs and took them to Hans in Frankfurt. The case went to trial in Kirkonomi Crown Court, now called District Court, and Tani held on to his claim of being innocent and stuck to the story he had previously told the police about Hans. His wife also denied the accusations, saying that she was only helping his husband as he had told her to. According to Tani, in Japan, the wife does what her husband tells her to do. A psychiatric evaluation was performed on Tani, but as he had objected to one being performed, it was only determined that Tani was not mentally ill. The senior medical officer for Helsinki County Prison performed this superficial examination and in his statement to the court, he advised against a full psychiatric evaluation as Tani had been against one. A report was requested from Swiss authorities to find out if Tani had any accounts in Swiss banks as the other half of the money was still missing. According to the prosecutor, Lauri Lausma, finding the possible accounts would have sealed Tani's faith and proved for certain that Tani was guilty of committing the two murders. The prosecutor also stated that according to his belief, there was never any gold and that the sole purpose of the murders was to steal the 5 million marks Alavirta had on him when meeting Tani. The motive for killing Gomulainen was to not leave any witnesses and to make sure that Gomulainen would not request a share of the money for himself later on. In the prosecutor's understanding, Tani had first shot Gomulainen in the neck and then Elovieta by shooting him first on his side and then in his neck. The body of Komulainen was then transported from Kirkonomi to Vuasari in Helsinki the very same day in the trunk of a car. The body of Elavirta was dragged in a ski box from the holiday room at the golf center to a van and taken to Huvinka the next day. A key witness in the case was one of the mediators, Mikael Preisfreund. According to him, the whole trade was a big scam, fabricated to lure someone gullible to a secluded place carrying a large amount of money. He also stated that the gold never existed to begin with. He was previously negotiating the trade with Dunny, acting as a middleman for his English client. The first time Praise Friend ever heard of the gold was from a driver working for an embassy who had asked him to find a buyer for the gold. The price was 15% below the world market price for gold at the time. Preisfrau was told that the gold belonged to an elderly man who was well known yet shunned away from any publicity. Because of this, 
The trade was negotiated in small pubs, and the actual exchange of the goods was meant to go on in some secluded place, like at a summer cottage or in a detached house located outside of the city. Eventually, Preisfeld had started to become suspicious of the trade, as the whole thing reminded him of a bad T-class American movie. His words, not mine. Preisfeld himself would have wanted to take care of the trade in a large bank in Helsinki, but according to him, Danny stuck to his request of handling the whole thing away from publicity. Preisfeld finally lost all of his faith in the trade when at the end of a long chain of mediators, he met Yoshio Dani. Dani was introduced to him as the sole trustee of the elderly man, but Preisfeld doubted this and got the feeling that the main organizer of the trade was in fact Dani himself. He no longer believed in the existence of the elderly man. The negotiations fell through for good a bit before the murders occurred. The other four mediators were also heard from during the trial, and none of them admitted to having seen more than just flakes of the gold treasure. According to them, the rumors of the gold had started to spread a few years earlier already, but negotiations were only started the previous summer. Based on things that one of the murder victims, Juhani Komulainen, had told them, each mediator had come to the conclusion that the gold did in fact originate from General Adolf Ehrenroth. One witness stated that Komulainen had told them that he had seen several 10 kilogram gold bars completed with a Nazi stamp on an island that Ehrenroth owned. The prosecutor Lauri Lausma held on to his original theory and stated that General Enrod's name was taken advantage of in order to give the so-called trade more influence. Yoshio Tani was conveniently left behind the curtains by creating an image of him being the general's right-hand man. Despite this, Lausma did not find it necessary to bring the elderly general to the witness box as at the time, he was already 95 years old. However, Andrew did give the NBI, the National Bureau of Investigation, a statement, as his name had popped up multiple times during the trial. When the story became public later on, Andrew stated it to be complete humbug. As I mentioned earlier, Danny had flown to Japan after the murders, more specifically on the 23rd of April. A representative from the Finnish National Bank was heard from during the trial, and they stated that on the 24th of April, 2.5 million Finnish marks were tried to be exchanged into yen in several Tokyo banks. This money was in thousand mark notes, and it was not exchanged. Also, during his time in Japan, Tani paid 100,000 marks, about 25,000 euros in today's money, as a down payment for two rally cars. According to Tani, this money was his own, however. Tani held on to his story about the German man called Hans, and his defense lawyer, Matti Nurmela, found this story to be extremely plausible. To prove this story to the court, he aimed to show that the gold did in fact exist. One witness did say that Gomulainen had shown him multiple flakes of the gold and that he thought them to be drilled from a large object, as they were only 4 to 5 centimeters long. Normella also paid attention to the fact that grown men were negotiating a gold trade over several months. If this gold never even existed, how come the negotiations went on for so long? The murder weapon was never found. According to the autopsies of Komolainen and Elovirta, they were murdered with the same 7.65 caliber gun that most likely had a silencer. 
As I mentioned previously, five shells were found in Danny's home. Tests performed on them show that these shells probably came from the gun that was used, but Danny has not given any explanation as to why the shells were found in his home. The story about the German man Hans was never able to be proven, but the court found that there was sufficient evidence in order to sentence Danny to life in prison for two murders and a robbery. His wife, Mitsuyo, received nine months of probation for taking part in the concealing of the bodies. The widower of Komulainen and his son requested compensation for mental suffering, but the court denied these requests. However, compensation was afforded to the family of Eloverda for mental suffering in the amount of 110,000 marks, about 20,000 euros in today's money. The court also ordered that the money found in Tani's apartment be returned to the company of Elvirta. The motive for the murders was speculated to be unpaid bills and credit that the couple had, amounting up to 2.6 million marks, which is about 670,000 euros in today's money. Tani appealed his verdict but the Court of Appeals upheld his and his wife's sentences. The Court of Appeals agreed with the District Court in that the story of Hans provided by Tani was not at all believable. However, unlike the District Court, the Court of Appeals did find that requests made by the widower and the son of Komulainen were reasonable and ordered Tani to pay compensation in the amount of 30,000 marks about 7,400 euros in today's money. This is because, according to the court, the family had suffered a grave shock when their family member died as a victim of a homicide. Also, the shock was even greater as the crime attracted a lot of media coverage and publicity. The compensation afforded to the family of Eloverta was upheld. At this point, half of the 5 million marks was still missing and there was no word from the Swiss authorities. Danny was still not pleased with the verdict, however, and appealed further. According to the decision made by the Supreme Court of Finland, Danny did not have to pay the victim's families any compensation. It overturned the earlier decision made by the Court of Appeals because it found that the demands for compensation were not based in the law. This was a majority decision, the votes being 4 to 1. Only Justice of the Supreme Court Björn Newberg would have accepted the Court of Appeals decision. The Supreme Court of Finland did not take a stand on any other aspects of the case and so upheld the life sentence ruled by lower courts. Still, Thani was not happy and decided to appeal his case to the European Court of Human Rights as he felt he did not get a fair trial because the identification made by a key witness was untrustworthy in his opinion. Thani felt that the event should have been organized so that the row of people the witness had to choose from would have included multiple persons who would have somewhat matched the description the witness had given out earlier. This way, the row should have also included more people that were not Finnish, as Tani himself was Japanese. According to Tani, he was convicted more or less based solely on the description and identification made by this one key witness. The European Court of Human Rights did not, however, take his case. In their decision, the court reminded the defendant that it does not take up or research mistakes made by national courts unless there is a reason to suspect a violation of human rights. According to the court, Tani's verdict was based on considerable amount of circumstantial evidence and that the identification made by the witness was not crucial when determining the sentence. 
Because of this, there was no reason to question the national court's decision. However, at the time, the Finnish Bar Association paid attention to the identification of suspects and left an initiative to the Ministry of Justice, hoping for regulation in the matter. The law at the time did not include any regulation on how these identification events should be organized. Several lawyers stated that there is a problem if a witness or a victim is shown, in the worst case scenario, only one photo and asked if it was that person. The Ministry of Justice started looking into this and later on regulation was added. As previously mentioned, the rest of the 5 million marks was still not found and it would not be until 1999. During that year, Tani tried to get a hold of the rest of the stolen money which he had, as suspected, deposited in a Swiss bank before getting caught. Tani recruited a Finnish man who he had met in prison to help him by offering him 10% of the money. After being released, while Tani was still in prison, this Finnish man left for Switzerland. There, he managed to get into his possession the 2.5 million marks Tani had deposited earlier on. The money with him, the man headed back to Finland by train. The trip went well until the train arrived to Budgarden, which is located in Germany. There, for some reason, the German customs paid attention to the man and soon, the officers discovered a large wad of banknotes hidden in his jacket's lining. The notes were a target of suspicion, but the German officers were not able to connect them to a crime. After some further research, the officers deposited the money on a Finnish bank account provided by the man, which was in his wife's name. In Finland, though, the bailiff got involved as the couple had a lot of debt. The man tried to hinder the execution measures, but in vain. At this point, the police got involved and they eventually found out that in reality, this was the money Yoshio Tani had stolen in 1990. Later on, the money was returned to the company of Elvirta. After serving time in prison, Tani was moved to an open institution. The president at the time, Tarja Halonen, pardoned him in October of 2006 when Tani was 60 years old. In Finland, it is very common for the president to pardon a prisoner serving a life sentence after 10 to 15 years. It is not known what Yoshio Tani is doing or where he is residing today. Thank you so much for listening to the third episode of True Crime Finland, Crime Stories from the Cold North. I want to thank Jesse, Brett and Jessica from the Facebook group Podcasts We Listen To for helping me with this script. I really appreciate it. If you like this podcast, I highly recommend you also check out Jessica's podcast Kiwi Crimes, which details crime cases from New Zealand. Art is by Mark Bernia. You can email him at markprnanmail.com. That's M A R K P R N at mail.com. Music is Night by VVS Music. If you have any questions, suggestions for future episodes, or anything at all you would like to tell me, you can contact me via email at truecrimefinlandpod at gmail.com. I also have a Facebook group called True Crime Finland Podcast, and I accept everyone. The next episode will hopefully come out in two weeks. Stay tuned. You can find me on my website at truecrimefinland.squarespace.com and on Stitcher, Podcast Addict, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts.